xin đâu nó chỉ ăn quá cơ nè ai đây nói chị shopping center in uh, uh, Linus. No, no way. Okay, Mungina, hi, 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 go. No, this, this is not good. Bánh này là nhiều. Bảy, bảy đồ bánh thế này. Did you take it in Carmen Olin? Yeah, okay, it's good. Bảy, bảy đồ, bảy đồ bánh này. That's what good to say. Bảy đồ bánh này. Còn này nhiêu rồi? Còn này nhiêu? Không để Này sẽ quýt nhiêu? Không để hả? Right there, 55 Nó no, này nè Này không để Không phải nào không làm cái ô một lòng một bơ bơ gì đâu Bơ gì đâu hả? Bơ gì À, tụi mấy tôi avocado nè Avocado là nhiêu? hai chú phát là gì đó không hiểu dễ sợ này là Đây bất cứ em lấy cái xem camera chụp không? Theo lịch 115 đầu một ký Tức là khoảng chừng bao nhiêu ta? Nên đem ra khoảng không đồng hai đồng rưỡi Có 10, 15 đô, 15 đô một ký, một, một, một ký, ký, ký đô Này queo nè Queo với chụp, chụp, chụp đây Chụp, 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 cái bò này ô nó rẻ hơn bò cái bò là 300 tức là nhiêu ta đó 330 một ký là nhiêu tức là 4 3 3 đồng ký kilo cái bò ồ để lắp lên 3 đồng ký lô bò này 
bốn 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 trăm mấy bốn trăm mấy là bao nhiêu là bốn bốn mấy là nhiêu đó là sáu sáu kg một một kg này các bạn này đây 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 We wait for to go to a bon star. Fishing village. Fishing village. You are. Different you. Different you. Different you. No, no. Different you. Different you. Different you.
Ich da ruhig, jetzt habe ich. Sofort lagen. I need to do them there. Yeah, it's just early. It's still early. Okay. Just going to tourists, không không có ai ở đây hết. Does it run on the schedule? Huh? The schedule, right? Very quiet, quiet place. Mấy đưa ba cái bánh ăn con. Đây vậy. Rain.
Oh, did I fit head? For what? <laughs> chụp đi ngay con. Chụp đi. Fit head. Oh, fit head. Oh, all the fit head. <laughs> I don't know what they do for. See, it's a very quiet city. They got got two of them. Yeah, they die fish and and. Uh, Under we know the house. The right fish. Go to the bus. Right bus.
Hey, we got a chain now. We chain fly uh, this hill, this mountain. Lord of the Rings, Journey to Mount Doom.
Arctic Circle of Water. Huh? Well, yeah, obviously you're in the Arctic Circle.
Today, uh, Sunday, uh, June 17, 2012, we, the ship was uh, cruising on Arctic Circle. So uh, uh, we had all day Sunday, uh, all day uh, Sunday, no, no night, no dark. And we arrive in uh, Swabon tomorrow morning at uh, 9 a.m. to 7 p.m. I'm history. From the fury of the Northmen, dear Lord, deliver us, was a popular prayer that is still inscribed in some of the seaside churches that you find across the Netherlands and even in France, where these people were feared. The Viking longboat arrived on the horizon, struck tear terror in the hearts of so many people. Now these are not to be confused with these Minnesota Vikings. <laughs> <laughs> 
You know this guy's mama was proud to see him on national television. But there is a connection. There was a strong migration from Scandinavian lanes in the Midwest of the United States. In Minnesota, which is of course their trademark here, the Minnesota Vikings, and in North Dakota. A lot of Scandinavian families settled there. You may have seen a movie back in the early 60s, a great movie with Kirk Douglas and Tony Curtis. If you haven't, now that you have visited theirs, you might want to go back and rent it and have a look at what was a very accurate portrayal of the ruthlessness of this time, how these people live. The word Viking itself, where did it come from? Well, there's a couple of stories here. In the Old Norse, it was a noun and it was a verb. And now, now he was a pirate, a sea raider. And to be a Viking, that was, was the noun. However, when they used it as a verb, it was to go Viking, to go on an expedition. Originally, these were voyages of conquest. They became voyages for trading, set up a huge trade empire that we will look at. In the Old English, it was purely a pirate. Purely a pirate. He was a sea robber. Now, this is the Viking age that we talk about. About a 200-year period from the end of the 8th century all the way up to the early part of the 11th century. When these guys spread from Scandinavian homeland all the way across the North Atlantic, down through the, out the British Isles, through this part of the Western Europe into the Mediterranean, all the way to the gates of Mesopotamia, and from the bases here that moved inland, people from what are now Sweden, coming through the rivers, all the way down to the Black and the Caspian Sea, setting up a huge trading network at that time into the heart of Russia, Sicily, all the islands down here in the Mediterranean, right even here to what is now Jerusalem, and further eastward into Mesopotamia. My parents came from Greece. I was born in the States, but I'm going to throw some really difficult Greek words at you from time to time. Mesopotamia, Meso in the middle, Potamia, rivers, the land between the rivers. That's the Tigris and Euphrates rivers, what is now Iraq. So from here, all the way here to the northern part of Newfoundland and Labrador, is where these people were roaming as raiders originally. But they became traders. Look at that trade network from Iraq, Mesopotamia, all the way to the high Arctic in Canada. They were also Democrats, not in the American political party, Democrats and Republicans, but Democratic ideals. Matter of fact, they had the oldest surviving parliament in Europe. Anybody know what that is? Good trivia question. Iceland, exactly. Oldest surviving parliament in Europe is in Iceland. And they were known for their craft in metalwork. The great work they did in gold and in silver. When they unearthed some of these Viking finds, they see some unparalleled beauty in the jewelry that they created. And in the meantime, guess what? They just had half a millennium before Christopher Columbus. Didn't leave anything. Columbus and that age of discovery course would settle in the world. These guys, however, were there. Who were they, however? Where did they come from? Why did they leave wherever they were from? When did that all take place? Well, these are the questions we want to look at. And when we look at who, we'll see, of course, they are the Scandinavian people of what is today Denmark, Sweden, and Norway. They came from that general area. They went in different directions, however, in their voyages of conquest and of exploration. The people of what is now Norway, the Norse, primarily up here across the North Atlantic and in the northern part of England, the British Isles. The Swedish people went eastward. People from the settlements along the shores of Sweden followed the rivers into the very heart of Mother Russia, the Don, the Volga, all the way down into the Black Sea and the Caspian Sea. The people in what are now Denmark, they moved to the southern part of the British Isles, southern part of England, along the coast of France, all the way down to Spain and into the Mediterranean. The Viking settlements from those days pretty much clustered along the coast, not much in the interior. You may have seen why. Those rugged mountains that you saw yesterday in Lebanon and the Lofton Islands were repeated throughout much of Scandinavia down here along the coast. These wild forests that were all of the interior. So that led to the great notion that these people were larger than life super warriors, clustered in settlements along the coast, and finally moved out. They lived in these longhouses, and if you went to the museum yesterday, you got a glimpse at what life for the Viking people were. They used many of the forests here, of course, for construction of their boats and for these houses that looked like an, a, an upside down, an inverted Viking longboat to shed the huge amounts of snow and ice that they get in the wintertime. And that longboat was this, a high prow, mainsail right there in the front, just a square rib ship. 
that was used. Open ocean, crossing. Now, we've been pretty comfortable moving along here. It's been cool in our waters. But think of being in an open boat in these waters for days at a time. And we've been in pretty calm seas. It's not always like that. These open boats that they used had that one square sail, which was fine if you had a following wind, if the wind is from behind you. How about it's from your beam or if it's off the bow? Couldn't sail. Couldn't sail. Had to pull this sail down, put the whip to the guys down here below, and get them with the oars. You're going to row their way to many of these destinations in open boats, in the weather that they, they had grown accustomed to living in. And what kind of sailors must these guys have been? Some of these boats are still on display. This one in Goat Stock shows the beautiful work that they did and would in creating these vessels that would carry them across these vast stretches of open ocean. They also had a ship that was called the Gnar, K-N-A-R-R. These were much broader beam vessels that were not the attack ships that the soldiers would be in, the Viking fighters. These were for supplies and provisions after these people made their landfall, which they knew they would need to live, wider beam. Now, we see who they were then, the people of Scandinavia. Why did they choose to leave? Pretty nice looking area up here. Why did they leave these coastal settlements that we find all along the Danish, the Swedish, and the Norwegian coast. One answer that archaeologists and historians have advanced is that maybe they were at a point where they had outgrown their ability to feed themselves. Agricultural potential has lacked. It's too many people, you can't feed them all. You can imagine, and what you saw yesterday in Lebanon is being repeated up and down the coast. Not that many areas for great agricultural production. Very rocky soil, very steep. A lot of that had to be refined. If that were true, though, some people said, well, why didn't they just move into the interior? You've got your coastal settlements. You've got a lot of very beautiful areas in here. Instead of trying to find other areas to move to, just stay where you are and just move into the interior. Norway's coastline answers that. We talked the other day about 1,650 miles as the crow flies from Nordkamp all the way down here to the tip of the peninsula. But one and a half times the distance around the world at the equator, the circumference, 35,000 miles when you take in all the islands. That's how much shoreline there is. So it is a beautiful coastline, but can you imagine before the days of travel, motorized travel, getting into the interior? That's a very difficult coast to maneuver. You can sail along it very easily, but these wild, rugged mountains, these cliffs that you saw, and many of them running right down to the ocean. You see some more as we get up to Nordkot. How are you going to get over these cliffs into the interior? Very difficult. can be done. If there were no roads, they would have to carve their farms, carve their roads out of this. These, these large fir forests that are in the interior of the country. You don't see a lot of that on the coastline. When you get in the interior, that's what we would find. They also feel that these people may have exploited a making place in Western Europe over here. Here's the Frankish Empire at the end of Charlemagne's reign. And just as it was with, with uh, Alexander the Great, when Charlemagne was out of the picture, many of his generals, as in, is in Alexander's day, were squabbling for the spoils of his empire. Could these people in, in the northern part of Europe and in Scandinavia see these internal divisions in what was taking place at the time here and decide to capitalize on it? Many people feel that that is what happened. They also were aware of what was happening in the British Isles. All the internal divisions from kingdoms from Northumbria all the way down to Sussex and Wessex mm -hmm. taking place as well. Easy prey when you have division at home for an outsider to come in with conquest. So that's who they were, why they may have traveled. What about when they decided to go on these voyages? Why was it not the 5th or the 6th century or the 12th or the 14th? Why was it this period right in here where all of this was taking place? Well, the answer to that, we look eastward, and that was the Huns some of the greatest light cavalry in the history of warfare, sweeping across the steppes of Russia, the fiercest fighters that had appeared at the time, just sweeping everyone in front of them backwards. And they moved westward and they moved southward. The Ostrogoths, the Visigoths, the Vandals, the Lombardians, the Burgundians, all of them were beaten by the Huns, pushed further and further, westward and southward. This would be the extent of the Hunnish Empire about the middle of the fifth century. They had just swept the opposition in front of them. Nobody could stand up to these people. Soon, they were pretty close to pounding on the doors of Rome, the Roman Empire. And Julius Caesar was assassinated in 44 BC. 
Soon afterwards, in 27 BC, when Antony and Cleopatra were defeated, we had the first Augustus, Caesar Augustus, the Roman Empire was growing, and for the next 200 years, it would achieve its highest level, from Britannia all the way again. What is the Holy Land down here? Syria, Lebanon, Israel, and Egypt, North Africa, all of the part of Gaul were pacified. No one standing up to the Roman legions. The Greeks had already fallen apart. The city-states, the squabbling that was taking place there, Roman status was used to occupy that area and later they brought in Asia Minor, what is now Turkey, into this Roman Empire. A great Roman lake was the Mediterranean Sea. Kept pacified, kept in order by the legions from Britannia all the way across North Africa, Southern Europe, on into the eastern shores of the Mediterranean. The Pax Romana was kept. But it was too vast, too unwieldy, too large an empire. It would finally be the Emperor Diocletian he says, you know what, we are too big. We need an eastern capital to serve as the capital of an empire that we're going to divide. Rome's still the capital in the west. We need one in the east. And for that capital, they looked to a tiny little settlement on the Bosporus that the Greeks had founded about the 8th century before Christ. The Greeks call it Byzantium, after their king Byzos. in Spain and on into the Mediterranean Sea. Now, the activity that took place in the northern part of the uh, British Isles up here would be the Norse people. It was in the end of the 8th century, 793 was the date, when the monks on the island of Lindisfarne saw these sails approaching. They were, couldn't be a good. Are these tourists? Well, probably not. They just heard the stories about these raiders, and here they would see them coming in their longboats. And they quickly realized these guys are not sightseers. They're here to take every single thing we have. And they did. They did. In addition to destroying, raiding all of these monasteries and the small coastal settlements here in the northern part of the British Isles, they were hauling off the women and children to be sold into slavery. Very profitable business in those days. One of the most noted of these was three raids they made on tiny little island of Iona. Here, you look at it today, you see well, why, you know, there's not much there to fight over. But these monasteries were the repositories of knowledge and wealth in those days, and many of them were targets for these Viking raiders. It didn't take long for all of Scotland, the Orkney Islands, just here. And this is a, a great cruise if you're looking to do some more cruising here in the future. Put the, the British Isles cruise on your itinerary, because we'll go up to the Orkney Islands here. The Shetland Islands, all of this area, the northern part of Great Britain would come under the control of these Norse people. Then they started looking westward across the Irish Sea, going to make the landfall all the way into the island here. They crossed the Irish Sea and they began raiding the coastal monasteries just as they had done in the northern part of, uh, of England, making their way into these settlements, again, striking terror and fear into the hearts of the people who lived there and certainly the, the monks in these monasteries. Uh, by the, the middle of the 9th century fortifications in Cornwall here in the Orkney Islands. And here is the, the Shetland Islands and here is the mainland here. It's called mainland. And it's much more of, of a Norse culture than it is a, a, a British or anything else that you would find in this area. Uh, some of the construction that you still see, again, sod houses and stone. Not much in the way of trees up there to build anything. And of course it's the home of these beautiful Shetland ponies. Got a little mom over the canoe a baby right here. After the Shetland Islands were pretty much occupied, we're going to go further northward and westward to the Faroe Islands. And just when you think you've seen the end of the world at the Shetlands, where do they get a glimpse of the Faroe Islands? Rock, nothing but stone, these mountains here, these huge sea cliffs stretching out along the horizon. Pretty much a lot of what you saw yesterday as we departed, leaving out of the Lofoten Islands and those big rocks of stone. Of those sort of islands of rock and, and uh, snow that you saw there. Well, this is this amplified up here in the, or in the Orkneys and in the Shetlands. Here in the, uh, the Faroe Islands also have a great collection of these beautiful houses that you see. Again, in those open longboats, how many days, how many weeks are you sailing like this in these wild, stormy seas, soaking wet? They don't have the luxury of six uh, six star chefs that we're enjoying right now. Think of what you're doing when you're crossing these great expanses of ocean like that. By the latter part of the ninth century, one Viking chief named Arnerson would settle in Reykjavik, at the furthest westward that they had reached at the time. They would be called the first family 
began the, the era of colonization on the island of perfectly suited for the raising of sheep. It's cold, it's wet, and it's windy, it's perfect for raising sheep, just like they found out in the Falkland Islands. Same exact conditions. They would continue westward from Iceland all the way to Greenland. And again, if there's anything that's misnamed, it's Greenland and, and Iceland. Here is supposedly Greenland. I can't find any green anywhere in those photographs. It's nothing but ice and stone. Starkly beautiful in that, but not much in the way of, of a hospitable environment. It would be the environment, however, in which this man used as a basis for his continued search for new lands to explore in a westward motion. Uh, Leif Erikson, the son of, of, of Eric the Red, booted out of Norway for having murdered a man, settled in Iceland and in Greenland. Leif would continue his father's work and make his journey from Greenland all the way over here into what is now the far reaches of the northern part of Canada, sailing up these little fjords in different areas, trying to find anything in the way of, of nothing there to, to raid, there were no settlements there. They were creating their own settlements. And the premier one was way up here in Lanza Meadows. Now that is, is, uh, is a corruption of the French Lance on Meduse, the Cove of Jellyfishes. Medusa and the French is jellyfish. Cove of the Jellyfish. This is in Newfoundland, very northern tip right here, which as Jellyfish Cove became the center of the very first colonization effort of the Norse people in North America. For the past 50 years, there have been archaeological discoveries and, and excavations, a bit of, of anything that the Vikings left that we find here in North America. And it underscores the claim of these people that they were the first ones to arrive on the shores of the New World. Columbus did it in October 12th of 1492 when he stumbled into the Bahamas thinking he was in the Orient. It would take several years before they found out that he was not. But the Vikings were there 500 years before Columbus. About 1003 is when the carbon dating suggests that these settlements here in, in Lancaster Meadows will, will go back to. So while the Norwegian, the Norse people, were in the northern part of the British Isles, Faroe Islands, Shetland Islands, Iceland, Greenland, and then all the way to North America. The Danes were looking southward then. The southern part of England today uh, began their raids along that coast when they saw the disarray that these Anglo-Saxon kingdoms were in at the time, from Northumberland all the way down the coast. It's forgot visits in parentheses because they were certainly not visiting. They were conquering. Again, looting, pillaging, taking anything of value. The Senate, their entire armada, this is what we call the Great Army in the middle of the ninth century, and there, they were going to settle here. They're going to take it over. I'm going to show you how one battle, crucial, pivotal battle in history, had, it, had a different ending, would have completely rewritten the history of the British Isles. Uh, the Danes had the same success that the Norse people had up here in the north. York would fall in 866 and would become, as York did, their capital in this land that they were intent on the sea. And it was a one of the pivotal battle in history. The Danish king, along with several of the royal court, nine of his earls would be killed in battle. That forced them to withdraw. First time these guys had ever stepped backward. That Scandinavian move was always forward. These guys would finally be beaten. It was a hero that came forth at this time. Anytime there's a, a stage set that requires somebody to take that stage and become the hero, usually somebody appears. In this case, it would be Alfred. Alfred of the Anglo-Saxons. He was a brother of the king down here in Wexford. And the story of England really begins with Alfred, the England as we know it today. As his brother died, he would become the king and the military commander of these people. And he is the only English ruler to have the name the great Viking forces that they were facing. Had that battle gone the other way, the whole course of English history would have been rewritten. We had much Danish presence here. How long would that have lasted? Don't know, but it's great to wonder about the what ifs in history. The Danish king was gone from East Anglia at this place, and he decided that he, you're encircled, you're not going to fight to the death, we're going to give it up. And they did. He promised to leave Wessex never to return. He also made a promise to Alfred to be baptized and become Christian. Well, Alfred says, okay, let's do, it. let's do it right now. I'll be your sponsor, your godfather, so to speak. So he did. But would be the first Dane then baptized as a Christian. Well, Alfred would continue with his successes with the number of attacks, driving the invaders back all the way to London. 
And I went a few years ago, I wanted to find a plaque in downtown London that was put in 1986 for peace and relative stability for a while. The Danes then started looking towards the coast here of Normandy. Remember, these are the same invasion beaches of Operation Overlord, June 6, 1944, the invasion of Europe by the Allies. Well, the Danes came ashore in these areas and quickly go and resist them. They seized Bordeaux, Perigueux, Limoges, Angoulême, and Toulouse. Angers, Tours, and Orléans are annihilated, and innumerable fleet sails up the Seine, and the evil grows in the whole region. Well, that fleet would come all the way up the Seine to Paris. A Dane, Ragnar Lodbrok, would level Paris, sack the city in the middle of the ninth century, and the locals finally, not able to resist him, they're going to pay him to leave. <laughs> he took the money and he left. Why? Okay, these guys have money, they can't resist me. I'll take the money, I'll stay. Great Battle of Hastings there, 1066. Harold of the Anglo-Saxon King would defeat William, uh, would be defeated by William, and would, uh, William the Conqueror then would establish the Tower of London as his great symbol of power in London. Now with all of these conquests, over a couple hundred years, they built the great power of the Vikings as a much feared warlike people and as a very successful trading empire. What would cause all of that to crumble? Why do you suppose all that started to drift away? The Viking Age in Ireland would hasten much of that and where much of it would begin. Again, the stage is set for a hero, and a hero is going to appear, and that would be Brian Maru, the great national hero of Ireland. I want some fascinating reading. Take a look at this guy's life story. He was fighting when he was 70 years old. Fighting when he was 70 years old. He was the, the son of one of the local rulers, and he had come up through the ranks. No better way to, to gain recognition and the respect of the people that you're leading is if you come up through the, through the ranks not appointed by staff here. All of these islands that they hopscotch to. All of the trade network that began down here, Mesopotamia, all the way across to the high Arctic. Much of the history that they left us is written on these rune stones. And these are amazing to see because they're kind of hieroglyphic, keys to the past that archaeologists are studying these runic inscriptions to find the dates, the names of these rulers, these Vikings who were on these different expeditions. England, all the way to the gates of Jerusalem. When you see some, you just wonder how they pick all of that out. But these scholars that have studied, just like the Rosetta Stone, unlock the key to the mysteries of the pharaohs and the language, the, the, the pharaonic language they had here. Here, we're looking at that same history of these rune stones in Scandinavia. Uh, bar at the uh, Greenland Sea right now. Greenland Sea go to uh, Siwa, the uh, Squaw Bar. 60 or 1 euro 20. Okay, so that is more or less what are very high. <laughs> as everywhere in Norway and Svalbard is also. They even sell rocks sometimes when you go out there on the pier. So uh, they tried to make a business of everything in this little island. There are only 2,000 people living there. So we will actually be more people coming to Svalbard than people living there. There are only more polar bears than uh, people on the table. So let's have a look at where we're located at and where we will be arriving. We are now sailing up towards uh, the, the North Pole. And uh, when we arrive in Svalbard tomorrow morning, we will be 640 kilometers north of mainland Europe from the northernmost point and just in between uh, mainland Europe and the North Pole. The Svalbard is an archipelago, the biggest island that would be the Spitsbergen Island. And here we can find when we go in, when we will sail in, in Ice Jordan. This is the Ice Jordan that we have here and we will be sailing in there and there we will be docking. So there won't be any tendering. Okay, so no, no small boats to go into the harbor. We will go straight into the harbor, so we will be a bit quicker. And uh, so for all of you who are on tours, uh, make sure to check what your uh, ticket says, where to meet, and what time to meet. If it says that you meet on the pier, well, you go to the pier, you just go off the ship, the, the gangway will be on deck one midship. So uh, there everyone will be able to get off. We will be arriving at 9, so normally at 9.30 people are able to get off. If you're planning to go to the museum, to the tourist office, if you are traveling independently, this will open at 10 a.m. in the morning.
And uh, if you are going on excursions, you will be moving around in this area. You won't be going much further because of the, because of the risk of polar bears, of course. Uh, you can't be uh, wandering around in the no man's land there. So uh, when we explore Svalbard, we will be able to look at a lot of interesting things and do a lot of active things as well, such as going by kayak. Uh, some people are going out on the ice fjord and uh, and the deep uh, deep sea rafting, uh, or as well you will be able to go hiking. Some of you are going up to the Plateau Mountain hiking. Some of you are going on an Arctic hike. If you travel independently, well, I would suggest you to try to go and check with the tourist office. They're located in the museum to see what they're able to to offer you. Um, we are a lot of people, so uh, yeah, first come is the one that will be served first. Or maybe try to go in the afternoon, there may be not that many people going out there. So um, the resources are limited on the of the village and the mining industry here. The mining industry here is very important. It's, no, it's abandoned now by the Americans. It's only a small Russian settlement still left in Barentsburg. We also have the trapper station that a lot of people would be able to see there. The trapper station, this is where you have the sleigh dogs and there is also where the hunters live. Where they do their business with the hunting of bear, well, polar bear, they're not allowed to hunt anymore. They also hunt fox and um, walrus and seal. And of course, I cannot stress this enough, for you who are renting a car, if you're doing uh, going off on your own, no one should go beyond the edge of the town. You cannot venture out on your own because there is a real, real danger of polar bears. And uh, if you're going out on a tour, you will be accompanied with a guide that has a rifle. So just in case, um, this is what the safety measures that you need to take when you go to the small bar. They won't be as cute as this one on the picture. I can promise you that. And we are located on the western coast of the Spitsbergen Island. And as I told you, it's the largest settlement uh, in, the, in this part of 